we invite you all to bow with us in silent prayer. I'd like to welcome you all to our divine service this morning. You know, I'm sometimes a visitor here myself and, and I see a lot of people <laughs> that I haven't seen before. So I'd like to welcome all of those, especially who are here who probably don't know me either. <laughs> welcome to our divine service this morning. Um, there are a few announcements and we'll start with Dean. Dean. Come up, please. Just recently in the record, there was an interesting article about medical professionals, about doctors. And uh, I have a very high regard for the uh, medical prof profession and for those who work in it. And uh, the article indicated that uh, a lot of what a doctor is taught in their first year in medical school very quickly becomes obsolete or even worse is not quite correct. And uh, I've seen some of those things over the span of years and I thought, I wonder how that relates to health as we as Seventh-day Adventists believe it. Um, health came to the Seventh-day Adventist Church in a uh, large way in 1863, 160 plus years ago now. Ellen White's teachings on health have been verified many times over the years and uh, not one of them has found to be doubtful or in error. Please consider this. There was one among us who wrote and spoke with uncommon authority. It's well worth keeping in mind, isn't it? Jacob, this is not the sermon he's preaching. <laughs> I'll make sure it's not a sermon. Well, good morning, church. Um, I want to make a quick announcement. This is going in regarding to our, our nominating committee. Something that we um, want to move forward with, forward with as a church is serving where we believe we are with the giftings that God has given us. And so I've crea we've created a little uh, survey thing, pretty much saying the first question being, how are you currently involved here at the church? How would you like to serve the church? What do you believe... Um, how do you believe God would like you to use your gifts and talents to serve our church? And maybe, it, and the third question being, maybe it's not exactly a church position per se, but I just like to serve based on interests, passions, or skills uh, that I have. And so there are three questions, and there's other thoughts. These are this is going to be handed out throughout our offering time, and I encourage you just to fill it out so that when we when the nominating committee meets very, very soon, that we can go, hey, we have people who are passionate about serving in this area, and we're not just trying to fill positions with random people for the, for the sake of it. Um, this is your church, and so we would love for you to feel that you are in a space where you can use your gifts, your talents, your passion for serving your church and the community wholeheartedly. Um, so that, and now, in case you may not know of all positions, there will be a second form which has the different positions that we have as a church, so you should receive two forms. We're not going to put a time frame on it because I don't want you to feel rushed through this. So although it's handed out through the offering time, um, please, if you want to fill it out straight away, go, go for it. Um, but feel free to fill it out after the, the service and return it to uh, either deacons or myself as you walk out. Um, so, yeah, that's something we'll be doing a little bit later. So, thank you for taking note of that. We will commence our worship this morning with our first hymn, 483, I Need Thee Every Hour.
487. In the gut. <coughs> who are able to kneel with us in prayer. Heavenly, more, Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with praise in our hearts, Lord. We just want to praise you over and over again. And Lord, we thank you for the wonderful musicians that you've sent along to accompany our singing this morning. We praise you for them as well, and we thank you for sending them. Lord, we thank you for sending Jesus so long ago to come and live like us and show us how it's done. But Lord, he died on the cross for us so that we can spend eternity with him. And Lord, we just want to praise Jesus for this wonderful gift that he's given us. And Lord, as we accept that provision into our own lives on a daily basis. Lord, we will see the wonders of your glory shine out through us. Lord, we thank you for the many gifts that you give us, life, health, strength. Lord, if there's any sick amongst us this morning, we ask that your hand will be upon them, ease their suffering, take their pain, and bless them, each one. 
Lord, those who are not with us this morning, for many reasons, Lord, we ask a blessing upon them as well. And those who are watching online, we ask a blessing on, on those ones as well, please, Lord. And Lord, as uh, Jacob opens your word to us today, Lord, may we see fire from on high. As your words come through, Jacob, and steer us ever closer to the kingdom of heaven. Lord, remain with us this day, and we ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning's, this morning's offerings will be uh, local budget in the gold ring and Northwest Christian School in the blue ring. I invite the deacons to come forward and take up this morning's offering and hand out those sheets as well. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you give us an income and we can bring a portion of this back to you. And Lord, may this money be used wisely for the furtherance of the gospel in our schools and in our church here. And we ask for these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number six hundred and no. 
I'm dyslexic, it's 262. <laughs> sweet, sweet spirit. <laughs> So I'm going to come and sit down. Jacob. <laughs> you know, this young man sat at my feet ten years ago. Now I get to sit at his. <laughs> All right there then, Ray. <laughs> you can have a good smell as well of any socks or anything right there. Well, good morning again, church. Happy Sabbath. It is really great to uh, be with you um, and to our online viewers as well. If Thank you for tuning in and uh, live, or if you are watching this a bit later, thank you for tuning in and worshipping with Devonport Seventh-day Adventist Church. For those who don't know me, uh, my name is uh, Jacob Ellison, the intern pastor here at Devonport, and uh, yeah, it is great to be with you. Can you recall the worst day of your life? Can you recall it? Oh, I hear many, many worst days. Just a really, really, really bad, horrible, awful, however many adjectives you want to put in there, really bad day. Hey, can anyone recall that? Yep. How about a really, really good day, the best day of your life? Can you recall that? And I'm, okay. In my head, I thought that'd be the other way around. Oh, you t- I can tell you about my worst day, Jacob. My goodness, it started at 6 a.m. and it was a long, 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 long day. You can recall your best day, you can call your worst day, or maybe many of those days. I remember the best day of my life. And it was kind of a little bit of a bittersweet, but yet still one of the best days of my life was, yes, baptism. And I can recall absolutely, absolutely, Everything, everything to detail, where people were sitting, the songs that we sang, the program of how, what happened. I can recall exactly everything. It was a wonderful experience. But the second, if not close to it, watch my wording, was my wedding day. Of course, my wedding day. Now, our wedding, the wedding for Morgan and myself was very interesting because we were married in 2021. We're in New South Wales and you've got like this second spread of COVID. And so we, uh, we originally being from South Australia, we're both in New South Wales for study. And it comes to the point three months before South Australia, well, South Australia for a while has said, even if you're a resident, you're not allowed in. We don't want, we want absolutely nothing, especially from New South Wales or Victoria, that, nothing. And so three months before we called it off because everyone was going to rock up to our wedding except us. And so we call it off, 
And so we planned a, a little thing. Um, we, we knew that this was the time for us to get married. So we planned something uh, small in Newcastle, a merry weather uh, Merriweather at the time, overlooking ocean is a wonderful view. We're only allowed 11 people. We couldn't have a reception after because of the rules that were, that were in place. We weren't allowed photography after. It, it was a very... And out of the 11 people, Morgan and I make up two of them. And so it, it was a very interesting day, but we rock up to the wedding, or to our wedding venue we hired. It was a part of a national park, so they, they gave us the warning, oh, you can't actually kick people off the premise. It's like, okay, why hire it then? But okay. Um, so, wonder, wonderful location, but the weekend that we got married, or on that Sunday, the government had just said, if you are vaccinated, you can picnic in groups of five. So, guess where everyone was at 5 p.m. on the day of our wedding. <laughs> Overlooking the ocean in Maryland, we get this call from the photographer, oh, where are you? Because there's no parks and there's no space where you want to get married. So our photographer was great and moved things to the, the side. We were two minutes down the road and we ended up getting married and this was the sort of spot. It was absolutely wonderful. So that fake grass overlooking what you cannot see um, is that there are 150 people behind us, <laughs> nine of them of which we knew, <laughs> because the rest of them are looking th uh, in this little dot on Zoom, 150 others. So we had a wedding of about 300 people that we didn't have to pay for, which was absolutely <laughs> wonderful. So yes, it was a very good day, and I think our, even our minister was shocked. I have 300 people listening to my <laughs> sermonette on marriage, on love, and the people were great. They soaked up every minute of, it, minute of it. They were listening, and there was music that they played at the end. Love is in the air. Um, yeah, it was, it was truly an experience, of one of the best days, and never forget it. But I can also remember my worst day, or worst days. And it typically comes when, when you're a very sporty person in particular and you have doctors or you have um, people, yeah, just people who know what they're talking about. When you, when you go to an injury and they say, you're not playing for 12 months. It's like, well, what do you expect me to do? Like, um, yep, yep, <laughs> but you can relate. Um, and then you say, oh, I've got this problem and they don't know what it is. And they say, we, the only way we're going to know what it is is unless we open up. So I've ended up having two uh, operations in, what, three years when I was 19, some 19, 20, 21. So two operations in three years. And so I've retired at soccer at the good age of 22. Um, but I remember the worst day was I was with, because my family, South Australia, I was with Morgan's um, sister and brother-in-law staying at their place. And after, especially the second one, they wheeled me out in a wheelchair, but it was kind of like they wanted me to start instantly putting pressure on it. There was no crutches or anything, so they wheeled me out of the hospital and said, all right, good luck, pretty much. And I remember walking from, I think it was about the lounge room through to the place, the room that I was staying in at um, Morgan's family's house, and boy, I've never been in so much pain. And I'm someone who can grunt through things like, oh, that's painful, come on, keep going. This was the, Morgan, I cannot do this. I, I cannot move. Even if it's just slight, it's going to take me 10 years to get, walk five metres. And in the end, by the time I ended up getting myself crutches because I wasn't putting up with it. But the worst sort of experience. Here I am, haven't had a socket in injury in the, all the 11 years that I've played, and now I've had two knee surgeries in three years, and I cannot move. Worst day, or worst days. I'm sure you can recall many of your worst or best days. And for Jesus, it was no exception. He had really, really good days. And then there were days that were just awful. And we're going to have a look at one of those days in particular 
uh, this morning. So I invite you with you just to bow your heads quickly before we open the Word of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word. Lord, you are faithful. You are with us in the, in the good and the bad. But Lord, as we look at the experience of Jesus in Gethsemane especially, we pray, Lord, that you will fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit, that we, be, may be, may, that we may be receptive to the message that you have for us. Lord, help us to, to contemplate, to visualise, to experience just a snippet of what Jesus was going through, the heartbreak, the agony, the pain. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. I said before that Jesus had good days, plenty of, plenty of good days, some days that were probably very ordinary and days that were just Awful, and especially as we go through uh, Jesus coming through on his journey to Jerusalem, the closer that it gets, the more awful it seems to really get for him. The struggle really becomes real for him. How many good days has he had? I mean, wouldn't it be a good day if you touched a leper and they were healed? Wouldn't it be a good day if you saw someone lowered through a roof, they could not walk, and you said, your sins are forgiven, Get, pick up your mat and walk? Wouldn't that be a good day? Wouldn't it be if you put your hands over someone's eyes and they could see again that that would be a really good day? There's a sense of justice here. The injustice that people are feeling and the mission of Jesus is correcting this injustice. Let me bring about justice in people's lives and there would have been many, many good days. People coming just to hear him speak. There's no one, there's something about him that is different. I'm sure there were many, many good days for Jesus. But then you might have your pretty ordinary days when you have a religious leader trying to trick you or just people who just don't recognise, choose to reject. Maybe a pretty ordinary day. But the experience here in Matthew 26 for Jesus, particularly in Gethsemane, is nothing like what he has experienced thus far. And it will be something that we we'll never have to experience, thank goodness. Jesus took on this experience, so we didn't. And as you read commentaries, I'm sure that words could not describe. The pain, the anguish, the suffering which Jesus was experiencing. Our title this morning for our sermon is a, is broken strength. The, stre- the strength that Jesus needs. So the strength that Jesus had and the strength that we have, it, it's broken. Matthew chapter 26, verse, starting at verse 36, and it says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and even deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Have we ever said that before? I'm so sorrowful to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further, farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Verse 42, again, a second time, he went away and prayed again, uh, went away and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. 
And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Verse 44, so he left them, went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Verse 45, then he came to his disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Painful experience. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. What does Jesus do in these 11 verses that we've read in Matthew 26, verse 36 to 46? There's three things that Jesus does that I believe help us um, in our day-to-day lives. The first thing that Jesus does is that he prepares. He knows what he's about to go and do. He knows the mission that he's going about to do. And he's saying to his disciples, verse 36, hey, come with me. And they came to this place called Gethsemane and he leaves eight disciples at, the, at this gate of Gethsemane. We know there's eight because Judas is gone. He's, he's in the act of betraying. And then he, Jesus grabs three others. The three disciples, Peter, James and John. And he brings them a little further into the garden. He leaves eight there and then says, hey, you guys come with me. You guys stay here. I'm going to go a little bit further. And pray. This is really significant. So Jesus knows that that what is about to happen, and the first thing, and what Jesus does is, I want to seek my Father. I want to seek my Father because that is going to be the strength that I need to be able to get through what I am going through. But I also, he grabs three of the closest disciples that he has. Peter, James, and John. And I know that something significant is about to happen because only twice, two other times within Scripture, Jesus asks specifically those three disciples to come with him. Number one was the raising of Jairus' daughter in Mark chapter 5. And I I really love you to follow the context with me. So Mark uh, chapter 5, particularly in verse 21 through to 43, I'm not going to read it all, but pretty much there's this man that comes to Jesus and he says, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. And Jesus went with him and there's a multitude that is absolutely, that is following. Oh, we're going to see what's going to happen here. He's on his way, but he's interrupted because there's a woman who's flowing with blood for 12 years. And she's seeking Jesus and she wants to be healed by Jesus. But there's multitudes and Jesus is trying to get through the crowds and he feels the touch of this woman that just touches his garment. And Jesus has this dialogue with her and ends up healing her. But by the time that that experience has finished, news has reached, your daughter is dead. You can imagine what that man must have been. You're kidding me. You heal this person. You stop because you heal this person and yet my daughter is dead. Jesus said, do not be afraid, only believe. And then he calls Peter, James, John. Come with me. Only you three. They arrive at the house. And there's wailing. This person is dead. And Jesus is like, what's this wailing about? She's asleep. He goes in and he raises this daughter, this girl, back to life. Peter, James and John see a resurrection. They see someone raised to life. The first instance where Peter, James and John are together. But then you go back to Matthew chapter 17 and we have the second experience, which is the transfiguration. Jesus takes Peter, James, John up a high mountain. He was transfigured before them. 
His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Moses and Elijah appeared next to Jesus talking with him. And Peter starts to say Peter things. And then it continues on the disciples. When the disciples, there's this voice that comes over. There's a cloud that overshadows them and there's this voice. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And the disciples are like, ah, we're afraid. Boom, down on the ground they go. We're not going to look because of the fear that they're experiencing. Jesus says, hey, you don't need to be afraid. They had seen Jesus in this glorification, in his glory, something they hadn't seen before and it brings fear to them. But I love what Jesus says a little bit later, which I find interesting in, in Matthew 17, 12. But I say to you that Elijah has come already and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. You would think that by seeing a resurrection, the seeing that Jesus could heal, look, raise someone back to life, and that, hey, Son of man is going to be done, things are going to happen to him. You would think that these three got it. (laughs) Because there's been other times where Jesus has communicated to all of his disciples, probably three times, of his death and resurrection. You would particularly think these three got it. And so when we come to the garden, the third time where it's just those three, particularly in the centre or coming towards the centre of the garden, that something significant is happening, that maybe they just understand. Well, we hear about what they do in Matthew 26. They're falling asleep. And we'll get to that a little bit later. But when we read this, we know that something Big, that something significant is happening. As Jesus goes into the garden, when you read Desire of Ages, it, he talks about how distressed he is. Desire of Ages says that the disciples could not recognize the face of Jesus. What's your look of despair? When, you, when you're feeling despair or anguish, what's the look that you have? Do people, are people able to recognise that look of, oh, something's going on here? You're typically able to recognise it, aren't you? It was unrecognisable. Because the sins starting to, he can feel the weight of the sin of the entire human race. He understands of, the, of the, what he has to drink from the cup. That's to come and we'll talk about that a little bit. A bit later, he you could not recognize his face, and it becoming that the strength he's becoming so weak that it says if the disciples weren't there, Jesus would have just crumbled to the ground because strength is just leaving him. The mission is so great, he would have just crumbled. It was the disciples who caught him as he's going on that on their way. Can you get that imagery? This was not just another normal anguish look. Jesus is really struggling. The pain, the sorrow. He's very weak. Broken. He comes to the garden... He brings his three closest friends and he says, just watch, (laughs) watch with me. Watch what? In Luke's account, in Luke chapter 22, verse 40, he mentions, we read a little bit later in Matthew's account, but as they enter, Jesus is saying to them, when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Watch and pray that you may not... What temptation? Temptation for what? Could have been a range of things. I mean, the look 
that they would have seen how they're perceiving Jesus at this time with their preconceived ideas that we were talking about last week. That this is the guy who's meant to be, uh, you know, taking over Romans. This is meant to be our victorious, triumph king. And what's he doing? Like, he's falling over because of how much sorrow he's experiencing. Like, what's going on here? Maybe the temptation to, to doubt. Maybe the temptation to perhaps disown. Let's leave now. I don't know. Maybe the temptation to actually maybe deny. I I don't know this guy. I don't recognise this guy. We read about one that happens a little bit later. Actually, in the same chapter. There could have been a range of things that they could have been tempted. Keep your eyes open. Pray. You'd think that they would pray, right? You'd think. You look at your master, your teacher, and how much sorrow he is in. Wouldn't you pray that he gains strength? Wouldn't you pray that something might be able to help him? Watch here, pray, that you may not enter into temptation, that you may not do. I I just need you guys to help me get through what I'm about to go through, to help support me. He is preparing for what he's about to do in seeking the Father, but also bringing his closest friends along and saying, I need support. He prepares himself. I wonder how often do we prepare ourselves for bad days? Not that you schedule bad days to happen, but how do you prepare? For Jesus, he's created a lifestyle. He doesn't just prepare for a a bad day and, okay, I'm just going to go and pray because I'm having a bad day. He's created a lifestyle for himself that even if time is good, when when there's been plenty of good days... And people were coming around him wanting to see more. I'm going to a quiet place and I'm going to go and pray. And as the Gospels have said, this was a usual custom for Jesus. Gethsemane is a familiar place. He's created a lifestyle for himself. Is that how we prepare for bad days? When times, when there's plenty of temptation... How do you prepare for your bad day? Do you prepare to do it with Christ? Or do you prepare to do it by yourself on your own strength? Jesus prepares. There's a sense of preparedness. The second thing that Jesus does is that he surrenders. Read the prayer. He says it three times. Follow with me, verse 39. He went a little further on uh, from the disciples and he prayed, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. We may know this as not my will be done, but yours be done. Verse 42, again a second time, he went away from the disciples saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Verse 44, so he left them, went away again and prayed the third time saying the same words. The same prayer three times. I want you to imagine that. Have you ever prayed the same prayer three times in just a short period of time? Very simple prayer. Lord, if the God, Father, Mark's record, he says, Abba, Abba, Father, if there is another way. Does this show you the human nature of Jesus? If there is another way, please, please, Let's make it happen. But if not, I will follow your will. This this really 
shows the human nature of Jesus because before the foundation of the world, the plan of salvation was set. And Patriots and Prophets tells us that Jesus is pleading with the Father, I will do this for the plan of salvation. This, I am prepared to do this. I will go if they choose to turn against us. If they choose to be disobedient, I will go. Please, let's make this happen. Creating human beings, it was a risk because there's the choice. Will they listen? Will they obey? Or will they not? Before the foundation of the world, this plan of salvation was set. Jesus is pleading with his father, let's do it. I will do it. And now he comes to the point in Gethsemane where it actually has to happen because unfortunately we don't listen. We go our own way. And Jesus is like, is there any other way? Any other way. I don't want to get out of it. I'm not saying I'm getting out of it. But is there any other way? The way we could put it is that the human nature is unable to endure the conflict which Jesus is experiencing. No human could ever do this. The human nature of Jesus could not do this. And when you read, there's a comfort in Luke 22, verse 43. Um, in 43, especially, that an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. His disciples weren't doing much. They're asleep. The angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. The Lord knows when you struggle. Though it may not be how Jesus is experiencing it now, the Lord sees and he knows the struggle. And what, what does scripture say? He sympathizes with us. Jesus has gone through it. Please do not feel you are alone on a bad, bad, awful, no good day. Jesus is there. He understands. There's an angel that comes. You imagine the thoughts that are entering to Jesus' mind from the enemy. Oh, if you give up now, earth's mine. I set up my kingdom here. I rule. Oh, your disciples, they're sleeping over there. Look how much support they're showing you. Oh, look, 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 it's going to be the religious leaders that come. The people who you chose to spread your word are now going to come and they're going to be, they're going to kill you. In the words of the apostles later, you Jews are the ones that killed him. Imagine those sort of thoughts running in through Jesus' mind. Everything you established, mm, it's all going against you. They want you gone. An angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. When there's thoughts, there's feelings, negativity against the will of God, God sympathizes, he is there. There's an angel, there is Jesus there, through his spirit also wanting to comfort. Sympathizes us with us in our weaknesses. In Mark, we get the account where Jesus says, anything is possible for you. (laughs) You can get me out of this right now. Anything is possible for you, but I will do your will. Jesus surrenders. He surrenders and says, Lord, how, how often do we pray that prayer? Lord, have thy will. How often do we pray it? But notice the context that Jesus prays it. Often we say, Lord, have thy will be done in terms of finances or decisions we as a church make with with relationships. Have thy will done, Lord, in, in many areas of our life that help the here and now, which is great. Please don't, un- mis- don't misunderstand me, which is great. But when Jesus looks at thy will be done, he has the big picture. This is where I'm going. When we pray, Lord, thy will be done, do we have the big picture of Christ in mind? Do we truly know what we are actually praying? God, it doesn't matter what my thoughts, plans is, I'm giving myself 
completely to you. And it is in his pain. Often we do that as well, don't we? Lord, have thy will done when we're in pain or because of that pain. Jesus' attitude has not just been because he's in pain, he prays that prayer. He says, I will not speak unless my father tells me to. I will not do unless my father does. That's part of his lifestyle as well. Do we pray, Lord, thy will be done with the big picture in mind of people being saved? We talked about last week how we share in the heart brokenness of Jesus when he's writing. He said there are people who don't recognise him, people who have rejected him. Does that break our hearts for knowing because of what Jesus is going to do? Do we share in the experience with Jesus here where we say, thy will be done? What is the mission that Jesus is coming to do? To make sure there is a way that we can be with him forever that we don't have to be continuously separated from the Father, but there is a way. Do we share in that experience? Lord, thy will be done. Do I share in the heartbreak of Jesus where I see someone who is lost and I go, oh, yeah, there, okay, that's unfortunate. Or do I share in that heartbreak of Jesus because his heart is aligned with my heart because I have said he is mine. Because I confess Jesus, my heart, my mind align with his. Does my heart break for what he, how his breaks? And I put it to Olverston when I did a baptism last week. Do we rejoice as Jesus rejoices? When someone gives there and is baptised, there's a party in heaven. <laughs> And what do we do? Oh, that's a nice, well done. Praise the Lord. Uh, Probably another year and a half till we have another baptism. Or do we truly rejoice that another person has said, I want Jesus for the rest of my life? And we truly celebrate it. That there's a controversy going on, a great conflict. There's no time for us to be complacent but to share in the experience of Jesus because time is running out and the mission of Jesus is, I don't want any to perish. I want all to come to an understanding of who I am. Will that be the reality? No. But that's my desire. Is that my desire? Does my heart break at the thought that people will not experience? Will ultimately reject what Jesus is about to go through? Do I share in that experience of saying, Lord, thy will be done. Strengthen me. Jesus could not do this himself. He's in a state of brokenness and so are we. By our own strength, we cannot do it. Thy will be done, Lord. Strengthen me. Equip me with what I need from you to do what you want me, what you're calling me to do. He doesn't just say, I want you to go and do this and leave you and go, good luck. Let me give you me. (laughs) Let me give you resources from me, which no one can touch. Nothing compares. Do I share in that experience? Jesus surrenders. Is that our experience? In our brokenness, do we surrender and say, Lord, I'm yours? Number three, the last point, Jesus wakes his disciples. He does it many times. You you read verse 40 to 41. He came to the disciples, you could not pray, watch and pray. You couldn't do this with me for one hour? (laughs) Maybe that's not the giving into the temptation that you're actually tired and you're going to fall asleep. Something big's happening here and you just, your eyes are telling you that you need to sleep and therefore you sleep. Maybe that's the temptation Jesus was talking about. Jesus wakes up. 
his disciples. You couldn't pray with me. Look, my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. I need you to pray with me here. Pray for anything. Even if you don't understand, just pray. Imagine the prayers if when Jesus sees his disciples praying for him in the condition he is, the relief that he might feel. The suffering probably would still be there. The anguish would still be there, but the relief of I have someone praying for me. They fall asleep and Jesus says, all right, that's enough. (laughs) It's time. I'm going to be handed into the hand of betrayers. (laughs) Maybe the temptation for the disciples is the temptation of what they're going to do. Because you read in the same chapter after Judas comes to him and shows him and says, take him away. What does it say in Matthew 17, 26, verse 56? Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. See ya. You're on your own. We're sleeping. And then we're fleeing. The guy who they'd been following for years. See you later. Friends, are we asleep? (laughs) As I share in the experience of Jesus, am I awake? Am I watching? Am I praying? You hear the language that Jesus says, watch and pray. Where does that sound, what, when does that sound familiar in Scripture? Particularly when Jesus is talking about second coming. Watch, pray. He says it a chapter or two earlier, Matthew 25 and 24. Watch and pray. This is something familiar to the disciples within the second coming, and we're very good at preaching that as a church. Watch and pray. Be alert. Make sure we don't come into temptation. The things that are against God. Because there will be people trying to deceive. Watch. Pray. Are we asleep? There are something called, in the Greek, a present tense. And that present tense means that the action that happens has no end. The action hasn't been completed. There are six words that continue to come up in the passage we've read of an action that is continuing, an action that has not ended. The first one is that Jesus comes. Hey, Jesus came to his disciples. Jesus continues to come to people today. Jesus seeks people He says, stay awake. I want you to, you as disciples, as followers of me, continue to stay awake. But you know what something else we keep on doing is sleeping. We don't have the right perspective in mind. And while we're sleeping, we're not praying, (laughs) which is another thing that is to continue. The feeling of Jesus feeling grief and being agitated is something that continues. Don't you find that interesting? The experience that Jesus is feeling in that garden is continuous. Do I share in the experience with Jesus? Am I awake? Am I grieving at this, uh, the prospect of people who are made in the image of God not being in heaven with him? Do I share that agitation? But you know what's also? My betrayer is here. Betrayer is written in that present. There will be people who continue to betray. There will be people who live life with Jesus and then just go the complete opposite way. We claim to follow Jesus, but go the opposite way. And I wonder, when I look at these three points, 
when Jesus says, wake up, know what's actually happening around you, know the time that you're in. I've told you about this many, many times. Friends, are we actually preparing ourselves? Just as we summarise this morning. Are we, are we preparing ourselves for what is going to happen in the future? The journey with God is not easy. Jesus was in a state of brokenness. Physically. His strength. Do I share in that experience with Jesus? Or do I say, here's what I'm going to do and I'm going to do everything that I possibly can to do this. Don't try and stop me. Do I do things by my own strength or can I say, Lord, I'm broken. I can't do this myself. I want to share the, in the experience with you, not by my own strength, but through your power working in me. I give myself to you, and as Jesus says, thy will be done. Lord, I can't do this. May your will be done. Whether you're the youngest or the eldest person here, the will of God can still be fulfilled through you. It may look different, but it can still be done. Because you can still journey with Jesus Share in the experience with Jesus. Am I awake? When Jesus comes and he's knocking at the door, am I awake, ready to receive? Or am I because I'm tired, exhausted, or I just don't have the right perspective at all? What will it take for us to have our eyes open to have the perspective and say, Jesus, I give you everything? Are you someone who this morning who has said, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus, but maybe my heart isn't aligned with Jesus? Maybe you're someone this morning who hasn't actually accepted Jesus. My question is, is what will it take for us to take Jesus seriously and his mission seriously? What is it going to take? There are only a few more chess moves in this world before it becomes a lot, lot worse than what it is now. And unless we are awake and surrendering to the will of God, preparing ourselves as for each day, friends, we might become the betrayer. We might be the person that, like Peter, who in the same chapter says, I don't know him. Because we haven't prepared ourselves and surrendered ourselves. What is it going to take to accept Jesus for who he is and to take his mission to surrender and say, Thy will be done, Lord? What will it take for you? I challenge you to reflect on that question and to share in that experience with Jesus. We're going to sing one more song this morning. It's called I Surrender All. If you want to share in that experience with Jesus, let's sing it out together. I Surrender All.
want to share in the experience of Jesus? If so, I invite you to raise your hand and by doing so, you're saying that I want Jesus and Jesus alone. I want his power, his strength in me because I am broken. We see the brokenness of Jesus and how much he needed his father. How much so do we? I choose Jesus, I surrender all. Lord, we raise our hands this morning because we say we want you. We are broken and we want you and there is no one else and nothing else that we desire besides you. Lord, we give you our whole self. We hold nothing back and pray, Lord, that your will be done in our lives that our heart will be aligned with your heart. And in the end, we, you can say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. And as we go out, Lord, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.